Looks like we have a pretty good crowd in here today. Uh, we're hoping that we can hear from all of you that you that want to be heard. Uh, we're hoping that your if you could make your questions rather succinct to us, then uh, we'll have the opportunity to answer more questions from all of you. Um, on a personal note, I would like to say thank you to all of you that uh, sent me um, positive thoughts and prayers while I went through my um, recent um, cancer journey, my breast cancer journey. It's not, I'm not completely done yet. I have another surgery in a few, in about 10 days, but other than that, I feel great. And I just want to remind you, I take every opportunity to remind all you women out there to please do your self exams and get your annual mammograms. So I have to, I have to um, remind you, I have to take this opportunity to do that. Um, and as for me, I just wanted to um, tell you a few things about what were wins and loses, or losses, wins and losses, I guess for, for myself. Uh, this past session, I had nine bills, and I was able to get three of those passed to the legislature uh, all unanimously. So they were all well received. Uh, the first one that I actually had passed was kind of a fun bill. It kind of went along with my, on Wednesdays, we wear pink as I went through my, um, my treatments. Uh, this was a, the Hunter's Pink Pink Hunter's Bill, so it's a, um, a very bright pink, blaze pink we call it, it's almost fluorescent, that, allow, that hunters now will be allowed to wear because we, we noticed um, in one of the Wednesdays that, um, well, I guess I back up a little bit, uh, uh, during, the, during the whole process, I, my daughters decided that on Wednesdays we'd wear pink in, in support of all women have, with breast cancer. And so my husband actually went out on a, on a Wednesday morning to go hunting and he donned a bright pink shirt underneath his bright orange vest. And he went out and realized how well it worked out there in the, in the uh, environment. So uh, we went ahead and I uh, studied up on it a little bit, found that we would be the ninth state that is actually um, passed, that passed that law. And so I decided to do it, like I said, went through and uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife like it and they're, they're actually implementing it now. So excited about that one. Um, the second one that I had was the Growth Management Hearings Board. Um, it's an indexing bill, so the Growth Management Hearings Board, uh, we have a lot of jurisdictions that wind up with a lot of lawsuits and charges and all that from the Growth Management Hearings Board, and they determine, they have decisions and rulings, and it was very difficult to get to those rulings. So um, counties and any jurisdictions that need to get to those rulings, they the website itself was set up very poorly, and so now we're requiring them to actually index it so that you can use keywords and, and that type of thing to get to those so that they can go in and find rulings that maybe they can um, f uh, determine that they, they won't make the same mistake again, or, or another county did it. So anyway, that was a, a good bill for counties and uh, jurisdictions. And then my final bill is one that I've been working on for the last four years, which is my, it's called the Deferred Finding Bill. It's basically, I know that you all know that there's um, a lot of cars in Oregon that are licensed in, or in Washington, in Washington, Oregon that should be licensed in Washington. In fact, about 12 years ago, w Washington State University did a, a survey and found that we had over 20,000 cars in Clark County that should be licensed in Oregon, or in Washington, sorry. And that was 12 years ago. And so I'm sure there's a lot more of that now. And along with that goes the driver's licenses that aren't being switched over as well. So um, I was, so what, when I was home, um, actually uh, recuperating from my surgery, I was watching TVW and I was watching my Ways and Means Committee. And they were talking about, uh, actually it was when they were talking about the out-of-state sales tax exemption and we started, they, some people there mentioned that uh, there are cars. I mean, the reason why we have this issue is because they're not paying the sales taxes. And so that's revenue coming in that we should be getting. So they started asking the questions about how many cars, and I'm sitting there at home going, 20,000 cars. Of course, they can't hear me, so. Um, but anyway, I was giving it a shot. Um, so when I came back, I talked to the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, and I said, I have this bill, and you are asking these questions. And so it's, it actually was in the dead file. It's called the X file, and it 
was dead. So they pulled it out, and this was the last 48 hours of session. They pulled it out, they heard it, it passed off the Senate floor, it went over to the House in the committee, it went off the, out of the committee, off the floor, and passed all within 48 hours. That's almost unheard of for a dead bill. So uh, <laughs> anyway, we're gonna, I've already talked to the prosecuting attorney's office, and we're getting the program rolling. What it does is the, it's a $1,500 fine right now for those that don't do what they're supposed to do after 30 days um, moving to, wa to Washington. So it will basically defer the fining. It'll reduce the fine for about f to $500 if they do what they're supposed to do. If they don't, it goes back up to $1,500 in 90 days. So the whole point behind this is getting them to comply, get their driver's license in Washington as well. So we'll see how this program works, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. So my time is up. I would like to turn this over to Representative Kraft to uh, tell you all about what she needs to tell you. Well, thanks to all of you, really, for taking time out uh, of your day on a Saturday, a beautiful Saturday, no less, and coming to join us this morning. This time really is for you, and it's so important for us to be able to connect and, and get a chance to hear from you. So with that, I'm going to try to be brief. Um, my name is Vicki Kraft. I've been serving, this is my third session in the legislature, and um, it's interesting because the first two years that I served, I actually served on all different committees that I'm serving now. So the first two years, I was the, um, I ended up being assistant ranking member on state government. I was on capital budget and, uh, and then was also on rules. Then this year, I was appointed to be ranking member or the highest ranking uh, Republican member on the local government committee and then was able to also get on to two committees I really wanted to be on since I first started in the legislature, and those are appropriations, and that's basically the House's budget committee, uh, and also K-12 education. And then uh, I was also assigned to the College and Workforce Development Committee. So I took on a new um, a leadership position as ranking member of local government and three new committees. In total, four brand new committees. <laughs> so it was quite a, a whirlwind of a session. Uh, and in addition, you know, what I'll tell you is, um, you know, as we look at the importance of being able to dialogue and work together across the aisle, right? I mean, we hear it from you all all the time. That's the reality if you want to get things done in Olympia. And I have served now in three very different sessions. And what I mean by that is the makeup of the legislature has been very different in all three sessions. When I started, uh, there was, a, what I'll say, an even balance of power. Uh, the Republicans held the Senate chamber majority and the Democrats held the House uh, majority. Then in my second year, basically that changed and uh, the Democrats took over the majority in both the Senate and the House with slim majorities. So what was interesting about that is we saw a few more bills that you know maybe we hadn't seen uh, previously, um, but there was still you know some really good uh, dialogue, bipartisanship, and it just you know things took more to probably work through the process still. Then this year um, things went into you know a much uh, stronger majority in the Democrat uh, the Democrat majority in both the Senate and the House. And it was just interesting. And I really, honestly, I say this to you in no way, I'm not trying to be partisan. I am literally just trying to tell you as someone who's still newer in the legislature, I haven't been there 20 years, and just watching the dynamics and the interactions that happen. So when things went into uh, you know, a stronger majority of one party, a lot more bills were introduced, and uh, you know, some things ran faster. Uh, you know, through the process, um, maybe not as many eyeballs on it as an overall. And I'm just telling you what is just interesting when you think about, um, when you talk to us about the importance of bipartisanship and working across the aisle and us having the dialogues, right? I think that's very real and very important. And I've just kind of sat back in some respects in, in, in the sense of kind of watching how the, the makeup of the legislature and the impact on how lo, uh, legislation flows or doesn't has been very interesting. So just share that with you. Um, 
As far as bills that I ran this year, uh, I ran a few more, I will say, than I was planning to. But, um, you know, again, some of that comes from constituent feedback. And some of it just takes um, a little bit of time to, you know, work through the process. So um, I introduced bills uh, relating to everything from, um, you know, helping small business to um, working to help disabled veterans. Uh, with basically tied in with a farming uh, aspect. So in that sense, I had probably two farming bills. Um, also, I had uh, a couple of sex trafficking prevention bills. And um, I'll just tell you, I'll, I'll pick the three that kind of moved furthest through the process. Uh, one was a BNO sales tax exemption increase. Uh, or a BNO exemption increase for small businesses. And really what it was was a, an adjustment for cost of inflation. The legislation hadn't been updated for about 20 years. So what it would do is allow small business owners to keep more of their monies longer before they had to actually pay in for BNO tax so they could ideally reinvest that money in their business, grow their business, grow jobs down the road from that. Um, that did get through the Finance Committee in the House, uh, did not proceed in the Senate, unfortunately. I had two sex trafficking bills. One that um, basically, in order to reduce demand for sex trafficking, what it would do is it increased the, the penalty or the fee for those who would be committed or uh, convicted of sex trafficking uh, of a minor. And it, current law has been, they can be uh, penalized up to $5,000. This would increase it 3,500 to 7,500. That bill uh, made it through the House and uh, did not make it through the Senate, unfortunately. Uh, we'll come back to work that one again because we're getting closer. We're getting better movement and better buy-in. The last one was a sex trafficking prevention bill uh, to really try to help law enforcement when there are massage parlors or reflexology organizations that look like that from the front, but you go in and they're actually um, you know, basically um, doing sex trafficking business, uh, it would allow law enforcement to be able to validate whether a worker there was really who they said they are, they are a legitimate practitioner of massage or reflexology in the state, and they would just have to keep their driver's license or enhanced ID near them so a law enforcement officer could validate, yep, this is who you say you are, and yep, that matches the certificate we have on file. Um, so that one actually was ready to be voted on in the Senate and didn't make it this session. So we'll keep working on it. But uh, again, thank you very much for being here. And with that, I'll turn it over to Representative Harris. Thank you. It's, uh, first off, it's a, it's a privilege to represent you in Olympia. Um, I've had the opportunity of being your state representative since 2010. Um, so looking at this, first off, I serve, maybe tell you what I do. I serve on the health care committee. I've served on the health care committee for, for nine years since I've, the entire time I've been a legislator. So been on the health care committee. I've been on education um, this last, for four years. I was the ranking member on education, and now I'm a member on the education committee. Uh, you cannot be in house leadership and be uh, a ranking member. So when I, I am the caucus chair, and so when I was made the caucus chair, you can't serve in both positions. So you decide if you want to go the policy route, if you want to be in leadership. And having experienced both, I'm not sure where I, what I like better. We'll figure that out. I think I might want to go back into the policy route and not deal with members so much. Anyway, and then I sit on the rules committee. Um, so, and the rules committee is a pretty simple committee, but it's actually very important. It's the committee that brings bills out of rules and onto the House floor. So, I think bills that, that to me, that were important to me uh, this session is I've worked on Smoking 21 for almost four or five years as a legislator. And uh, the bill passed this year, uh, which will raise the smoking age in our, in our state to 21, which I, to me, you might not agree with me, but to me that was very important. And it was a bill that I'd worked a long time on, and I'm happy to see that be enacted. Um, Another school, another bill that, that was really important to me is a school safety bill. Uh, we look at s shootings, uh, although they happen very seldom, thank heavens. But violence in our schools and how we handle that, the mapping, believe it or not, mapping of schools and, and how a school is mapped for safety. 
uh, isn't really hasn't been completely done in our state. So this bill will do that. It will look at SROs, uh, which are officers that are in our in our schools, and how they re react with community law enforcement officers. It's a very complicated bill, but it's a bill that I really think is very important, and that bill passed. One other bill that, that was very important to me is alternative pathways for students. Um, as you look at what's going on, we have a lot of students that might not want to end up in college, believe it or not. They might have an alternative pathway, uh, and we don't really have a set pathway for those students. Um, and this bill creates alternative pathways for kids that wanted maybe get a certificate in welding or a certificate in, in some other field, nursing, whatever, and it creates a pathway for them to do that. It also sets in place a high school and beyond plan. We've talked about that a lot as legislators, but a, an actual high school and beyond plan where a student can sit down and map out what he really wants to do. Um, we've talked a lot about that, but we really haven't done that. This bill does that. Uh, those are three of the bills to me that were probably the most important bills to me this session that uh, I think really will have lasting impact. And um, with that, I think we've got a lot of time for you to talk and to ask questions of us, and we will answer those questions. So thank you so much. This is Hi. Hi. So I, I think I think the the 1638 was a first step, at least for me, of looking at um, how can I get community immunity up. Uh, how uh, of the 74 cases of measles that we have, I don't think any of them had 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 been fully vaccinated. So at least, <clears throat> and I'm sorry about my voice, at least what we're looking at thus far. In, in our particular area, none of the people had been fully vaccinated who ended up with, with the measles. I don't know. Um, so this, this whole issue of vaccinations had um, been on my, it came on my radar, frankly, when I came into the legislature. I started, so this is back in 2016. Um, I started getting emails. Um, people, you know, I had some folks drop off packets of information with concerns about vaccination. I kind of, at that point, had popped it in a file and went, okay, if this ever comes back up, I'll take a look at it again. I came back up this year. <laughs> so I dug a little bit more into it. Um, and just the vaccine issue as a whole. I'm not an expert. But the one thing I will say is, and one thing I think was sorely missed by Department of Health, um, is, and, you know, and potentially CDC, I don't know. I, I'll just talk to Department of Health, state level. The bottom line is, one thing I took away is that vitamin A, I'm sure you're well aware, if you actually um, take, you know, enough vitamin A, and I don't know what that enough is, but, you know, just taking more vitamin A can help reduce your chances of getting measles. Um, I know one of the, you know, so that's pretty basic, right? We're all taking vitamin A and uh, if we're taking vitamins like one a day usually. So just being aware of that and putting that education out there, right, can help reduce measles. So right there you have an alternative form of prevention uh, to vaccines. I'm not saying it's the be all end all, but it is an, it's something we need to be exploring more and getting the word out on more. I also think, um, you know, when you talk about the statistics and getting real statistics of who's vaccinated, who's not, uh, there were a lot of concerns this session, many concerns. And um, without getting into, you know, we could spend all our time on this one issue, I'm sure, and not to say we won't take other questions, but um, I will just say the 78% immunity status that was continually being quoted by Department of Health, uh, Clark County Public Official, Dr. Melnick, um, from the IIS or Im Immunization Information System, that was deemed incomplete this session, during the session in March, by the Washington State Board of Health. And the reason for that, one reason, is because if you go into that information um, the IIS, I'm going to call it, Immunization Information System. It's a voluntary reporting system and included zero Clark County school districts reporting into it. Zero. 
So how can anyone of an official capacity be quoting those numbers as 78% being you know, what we're going to stand on as uh, appropriate for immunization status? It's not. They actually, DOH even asked for appropriations this year <laughs> to uh, build out a school module for that IIS. So kind of by their own admission. The other thing I will say is right after that legislation passed, now DOH on their own website is saying that uh, sixth graders across Washington State are 96, they have 96% immunization status. Wow, we just jumped from Clark County being at 78% to whoop, okay, now they're saying, hey, this, this legislation really isn't gonna impact a lot of people because you know, 96% immunization for MMR is uh, what we have six, with six squares across the state. There's a problem, to your point, this is my bottom line point, there's a problem in the numbers. Uh, there's a problem in the numbers, and I'm just gonna leave it with that. Uh, more should have been done, I think, before we moved uh, legislation through this session that's not directed toward anybody else. That's just my opinion on this. And I will say before any other vaccination bills move, we absolutely need to be more um, on point and accurate with the data. Thank you. So, um, Vicki just mentioned the IIS. It is voluntary. That's the reason why there were so few reporting to that. And so um, I think probably one of the things that I wanted to follow up on with Bob was that um, as, as time has gone on and as vaccines have, and by the way, I'm pro-vaccine. I have my, all my kids were vaccinated and I believe that they do good things. And, and for the most part, they, they do, um, it, it is good for the public. Um, the problem is the risk involved with the vaccines. When, um, with there, if there's risk, then there should be some choice. Um, the, the issue here, I think, with the immune uh, abilities when you get older is that when you, um, if you have the shot, then your immune ability does wane as time goes on. If you have the measles, then you're pr protected for the rest of your life. And so I think there's a lot of people out there that assume that they're immune because for years ago they, what, they wound up getting vaccinated, and now they aren't because it's years later and you're an adult, and so you're, you're you know, could possibly be contract measles if you ha are around it. So I think um, that's, uh, I think when we, originally when this first started, we met with the Department of Health here in Clark County. And one of the issues was um, their concern was those that weren't vaccinating and where it happened, because actually we're calling that an inbreak, not an outbreak, because it was within a, a small community. And um, he indicated that um, what they really wanted to do was to you know, find out why those people did not want to vaccinate and, and create a dialogue and, and build trust. And so I think that probably that's a good start. That's probably what they should do. I don't know that mandating was the, I do know that mandating was not the proper way to go about this in my opinion. Um, but um, I think that we do, I mean, you know, if, if nothing else, it will educate them as to why you, you those of you that don't vaccinate, don't. I think that they need to have those conversations. I know that uh, early on I came out against the bill and um, I actually did, um, probably shouldn't have, but I did a, uh, an HBO Vice program and it was sold to me entirely different because my daughter was actually involved in that one. And uh, in an hour uh, interview, they cut it down to two minutes and of course you know what they do when they cut it down to two minutes and that's exactly what they did. Um, so, um, I came out and but the, the and so across the country because this was out there across the country and I wound up getting emails that called me every name in the book and words I didn't even know, so um, it was and it was it was awful and and then and then it turned around and then um, so about five or six days I was I was the devil I mean and I knew nothing and I was a buffoon and I was I mean it was really something um, that's the problem is that we cannot have good conversations these days in a civil manner. And so I really think that that's a direction that we need to go. Thank you. Um. I can say, yes, that's easy enough. Yep, I made that part of my dialogue to make sure to um, stress the importance of religious freedom and really 
any any exemptions, uh, you should have those choices. Sure, I have no problem with religious exemptions. Um, but I have heard a couple words that I would disagree with. Uh, it was not a mandate. This is not a mandate. Um, I still have a child that um, actually had met with me just last week who had uh, severe heart surgery that still hasn't been able to go back to school yet because of a compromised immune system. So what 1638 did, did take away philosophical choices um, for, for an individual to attend a public school. To attend a public school, that's all it did. Uh, I believe that children in a public school setting and private, that's, I'm sorry, you are correct. All school settings, all school settings, I'm sorry, that is correct, all school settings. But I believe a child should have, especially those who can't be immunized, should also be protected. And uh, they were not protected in the past, and this student still is not at school today. So I believe in vaccines. I think that's pretty obvious. I proposed a bill. Um, I believe um, wholeheartedly in vaccines and will continue to be an advocate for, for, for that. I will not take away your religious exemption, but I've got to be honest with you. Uh, we, we, need to be, we need to have our community immunity up. Our kids need to be safe in schools. I mean, it's just that simple. And I, can, and I think you can see just in the room today, we have disagreements. And, 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 I'm, glad, and I'm glad that we, that we can talk about this. I, th I think... You know, and we have disagreements on within my own party. Um, uh, so um, it was a very divisive bill. Um, most Republicans didn't vote for it. Um, you know, uh, what's interesting though, <laughs> what's interesting is uh, there's uh, 33 states that don't have a personal exemption. Of those 33, 13 are controlled by Republicans in all forms of government. So this shouldn't be a Republican versus Democrat issue. I hope it's not. I hope public safety isn't, and public health isn't a, a political issue, to be quite frank. So anyway, and I don't want to have this whole, I do not want this, this whole day taken up with, with vaccines. I really don't. So hopefully we can discuss other topics that, that are of, of importance to you. So. Well, I'll go ahead since I'm holding the microphone, I'll start. Um, and so I'll just mention uh, briefly this, this uh, handout that I have outside on the table, I'm not sure if you've picked it up or not, uh, was my attempt of trying to show what the, um, the state funding increase has been pre-McClary to now with this session's 2019 enacted budget. So there's a lot of footnotes. Um, you know, in all, you'll see um, projected increases in total funding from the pre-McCleary, which was, McCleary was House Bill 2242, um, is where that started in 2017 session. So prior to that um, until now, and I'm just really quickly, um, Battleground has projected increases in total funding of 27.8% as of this enacted budget. Uh, Evergreen School District, 19.5%. Ridgefield, 46.3%. Um, and then, and I'll just tell you, Ridgefield seems like it's a little bit of a high number to me, so I'm just going to asterisk that. I need to, I still want to dig further in that. Uh, but Vancouver, 22.3%. So um, to your point of fully funding, uh, you know, we've put in easily over, gosh, yeah, $8 billion was just in the 2017 budget. And then you had 2018 was another $1 billion, And then this year, I mean... <laughs> I can't even add all the billions. The bottom line is over, yeah, it's about 10 billion is, yeah, exactly. And so certainly to that point, we definitely have put in more monies to fully fund education. We did in 2017 meet the Washington State Supreme Court's mandate on us as a legislature to fully fund K-12 education. They said you must, and we came back and say, they said you have. Um, so that was in 2017, and we've still continued to add more money. Um, so good news is, you know, K-12 is getting very strong funding. 
Um, as far as the amount of property taxes raised in 5313, if I get that right, yeah, um, the local levy option bill. So what that does in short is it basically provides, uh, because there were some who still said, you know, there isn't yet enough funding. So we went into session, special education was an area that we were continually hearing from school districts there wasn't enough funding for. So you have to do something. We need more money to you know attract and retain teachers, et cetera. So um, essentially the local levy option bill was passed. I will tell you that that was passed by the majority um, in both, well, at least in the house. Um, and it was really a pretty much a partisan line vote simply because, to your point, you all are paying more, you've been paying more, and you're paying so much more than even in, you know, like 2017 when this McCleary thing started. And now, you know, more has been made possible through a local levy option. The good news, I guess, is that the voters have to approve that, just like a standard levy. Um, but in essence, it will be uh, $2.50 per 1,000 uh, of assessed value or $2,500 for districts under 40,000 in full-time equivalent students. Same thing if you're over 40,000 students, it's just whatever's the less of $2.50 or $3,000 per student. Um, so in short, that's the bill. Um, I personally am not in favor of more taxes on you all. And after this session, so many taxes were passed. I mean, it's it's going to hurt, and I, I did not vote for them. Not, I voted for special education funding. That was one bill specifically I did vote for this year. Um, and I hesitated on that only because you guys have already paid in so much more. So anyway, I'm going to stop. I'm probably taking too much time for my cololleagues, but uh, with that. So, um, so am I understanding that you voted on the local property tax levies so that if we don't approve those levies, will we get under No. So the reason the whole back to the McCleary is because so much of the um, the salaries and all that were, were being funded by through the local levies. And No, that was No, yeah, that was in twenty seventeen. Right, that was with uh, 2242, House Bill 2242. So because, no, I'll finish my sentence here. So in 2017, it was 2242. So yes, we, we added the billions of dollars and we uh, became in compliance with McCleary decision. So in that case, um, the, um, okay, I gotta figure out here what I'm, how I, the, Funding for the levies was, there was way too much funding in local levies. And so the state then had to turn around and figure out a way to pay, to pay for uh, school education because it is our paramount duty to do that. So as we um, began to fund or determine that, we ha how much money did we have to raise in state taxes in order for uh, the local taxes to be reduced? So that's why your pro property taxes went down. That bill said it was going. You were, were supposed to get about a 70% decrease in your property taxes because uh, they, for for one year, the t the local levy went up and the state levy went up. That's why your taxes went up. And then the following year, you were supposed to get a 70% reduction in your local levy. And then the bill the following year, which was in 2018, they changed that, and they which and I believe we all voted no on that one as well. Um, they changed the ability to. Um, actually only allowed 30% dec decrease in, in your local property taxes. So yes, we did fully fund education and it was state funded. And so now what's happened is they're opening it up to the local levies once again, which now is going to be, um, uh, uh, it's just not gonna be equal education. It'll be unequal education and, and um, unequal funding. So. Because, well, quite frankly, um, many of the school districts bargained away their funding for teacher salaries. No, well, they were fully funded in 2017. That's why McCleary. That's why the. That's why the decision was made by the. Uh, that's why they allowed us to. Okay. Well, I'm okay. I'll, I'll just. So. Well, and that's, you know, this is a, a great point, and I appreciate your, your clarifying question. 
the perspective, right, of what fully funding is, is very different depending on whose shoes you're sitting in. So we met the Washington State Supreme Court's mandate of fully funding education. That included and was primarily, in my opinion, due to increasing wages for teachers. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, right? I mean, it was recognized we needed to recruit and retain teachers. So, you know, there was additional funding. And it literally went from 40000 starting salary up to 42000 ish so we were trying to hit the, you know, the attracting, re, re, uh, recruiting piece. And then there was, uh, from a state funding aspect, I think it was around, and you could probably tell me better, 92 or 96,000 uh, for higher end seniority teachers, you know. So we kind of tried, you know, because we, we, you know, kind of had to, okay, we're trying to do a state funding piece, so here's kind of the, the range. Um, and so within that, if there were some, um, Either if a district decided their administrators to pay teachers above that, they had to get it from somewhere, and or if the local, um, the local directive, if you will, was for more, then the administrators had to pull it from somewhere, right? And so that's where when you get into the, you know, we met the, fu the fully funding piece by the state Supreme Court, we addressed wages, but then when you get to the local levels, there is still discretion, and that discretion is what you know, you have to pull from one Rob Peter to pay Paul, I'll say, and I'm not saying it's not a good thing. I'm just saying that's what happens sometimes. And so anyway, that's more. Um, I'm going to pass this to my colleague who was on the uh, McCleary task force. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, can we take that question? I analyze market data for labor wages for a living and negotiate labor market. This is a private conversation. Yeah. We can take it I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, finish your question. Okay. One moment. Okay, so if I understood the question, if if I understood your question, kind of in 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 short, we didn't. And if you want to ask the Washington State Supreme Court, we didn't. Now, there were. If I'm a local level administrator and we fully funded, if a local, um, if a local entity, I'm going to call it, it'd be a union. But that's okay. If the and if the union say we want more funding than what the state's given, if the local administrator say I'm going to grant you that wish, I'm going to pull from this bucket over here and I'm going to put it into more wages than what we put down for that. They're pulling it from somewhere, and. Okay, so so in essence, I hope I'm getting to the crux. I don't. I appreciate you asking the question, and we can have more dialogue on that after. And I did. We're going to move on, and if you'd like to talk further, we are happy. We're staying after for a little bit. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pass it over. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Back in August, our 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 public schools. Said we don't have enough money to pay teachers. We can't give them the raise or ask We went through a we went through a strike. We did get more money. The uh, the district was very very uh, careful to blame teachers for any future budget problems. Yeah, towards the end of this school year, we've been told, hey, we're having big budget problems. We need more money. More money has come in, but the school district says we're going to need more. Uh, but this time they're blaming the legislature. At what point do we come to, do we, can we agree on where the, what the numbers are so it's not a blame game? Uh, I, mean, I didn't ask for a raise, but I got one. I'd say thank you, but that's, that's not the point. Um, it just seems like we're putting a tremendous amount of money into education right now. Not all of it's going to the teachers. But where can we, where can we see some real numbers? Because the local school district, specifically back in public schools, keeps saying, we have no money. Our, our, our superintendent is the highest paid public official in the state. And he's still saying, I don't have enough money. I'm going to have to excess teachers. Um, I, I have, uh, Representative Harris, I did contact your office. Mm -hmm. One of your aides was kind enough to send me some spreadsheets. Kind of, I'm trying to go through them, but I can't tell where all this money is going. We can't be that in college. Is anybody so, uh, so I appreciate that. Um, I almost hate to admit that I sat on the Education Funding Task Force and the McCleary Task Force, to be quite frank with you. Um, but but I did. I was one of the eight that was locked in the room for a summer to work on this program. Um, I believe we need more transparency, actually, in school funding to completely understand. Um, 
because the numbers are interesting. We have put, when, when we end uh, this session, we, put, we have put 10 billion more dollars into education in the last four years. 10 billion. I started this uh, being your state rep in 2010. I started in actually 2011. It represented 46% of the budget at that time. Today, education almost represents 53% percent of our budget in the state of Washington, okay? 52 point something. I'm probably exaggerated on the upper end, I'm sorry. Um, so I would agree with you, and I, I, I look at the numbers, and it's really difficult to decipher what's moving, what's not, where it's exactly going. Our educational funding is all done under allocation purposes only. We do not direct money, per se, into an exact program, per se. It is for allocation purposes only. We drive out $67,500 per teacher on average, okay? We now fund $16,000 per student in the classroom when they sit there, okay? Those are just numbers. Um, I would love, I will start working on this. Better transparency, because I probably sent you the numbers and you're like me, you're going through them. I have a good friend of mine, Dan Barnes, who's here, who's an accountant, I'd love Dan to go through them. But to be quite frank, he probably couldn't make heads or tails of it either. So I will try to get better transparency for everyone. We should all be able to look at these numbers and figure this out. It is very difficult, to be quite frank, okay? Um, so, but I can tell you one thing, we are spending far more amounts of money on education than we have in the past. I don't know, I know teachers, you got a raise. That is a good thing. That was actually the ultimate goal out of all this, I'll be quite frank, was when you looked at our teachers are being underpaid, and I believe that they were. And the goal was to get greater pay uh, to keep teachers longer. And I think it's a good thing. I don't know that we accomplished all that, and uh, I, I want to do that. So that was my goal. Um, we got part of it done, but we didn't get it all done. And McClure is very complicated, to be quite frank. Um, we, took, we took levy dollars that, if you understand the disparity that was happening in our state, some areas were able to pass a levy and could offer what others could not. That's why we took that money out of the levy and made it state money and hoped Try to level the playing field. Um, it's really hard for your question and back on property taxes, and our property taxes were to go down, but to be quite frank, you sit in a room, and we all voted no up here, but once you've taken the money out of your property tax, it's really hard for government to say, we're gonna give it back to you, and we should have. I wanted to give it back to you, and I still do, because I believe it was the right thing to do. We talk about affordable housing, okay? The more we hit property taxes, the less affordable your home becomes, okay? Rep Harris is 66, almost 67. I know what it's like to, I, you know, I, I'm paying those, we're all paying those property taxes, okay? I, I appreciate that, and um, I know there are many of you here today, as Alan mentioned. Um, I, I had the opportunity to go out just a couple weeks ago to visit with folks um, in the Rivercrest community uh, there and also in Fairway Village and, you know, listen to how loud it was, and it's loud. Uh, I, and I said, really, it's equally, in my opinion, it's, and this was at like two o'clock to three o'clock time frame on a weekday, so really not even rush hour, and it was loud. And so if you think about expanding and the noise increase, I, I agree, I mean, it's real. And so, you know, I've been having um, and followed up and had a conversation with Carly Francis, who is the uh, director of WashDOT here locally in uh, Southwest Washington. and. Um, 
you know, in the Fairway Village folks, I will um, give a shout out to, they have done a ton of uh, work and homework to, um, you know, I mean, they dug in and really took a look at the report, the analysis, their properties, and came back on WashDOT to say, we don't agree, this analysis is wrong because of this, this, and this. And WashDOT has since come back in just the last couple of weeks to say, you know what, you're right, we agree that the analysis wasn't done uh, properly in your area, we need to adjust this. So there will be funding given for Fairway Village. The um, south side, when I had the conversation just this week, earlier, uh, I think Monday or Tuesday, with uh, WashDOT, at this point, one of the things that they've come back with is that there's not a proper cost-benefit analysis for the south side there. And I said, so what that really means is there isn't enough density, people living there, to justify spending the cost. And she's like, well, yes. So that's not the answer we want. Um, the bottom line is um, there is a Federal Highway Administration uh, person that is looking at the analysis. Uh, we'll continue to follow up with them and looking at that to help maybe get some revisit on the south side. Um, and we need to look at what else is possible. I know there's a public safety issue on the public on the uh, south side. It was made very clear. Cars literally driving off Highway 14 into people's backyards. One person was actually killed. So you know, uh, and when I mentioned that to Washout, they you know she said, well. If it's public safety we're going after that, there's different methods to address that than a sound wall, which is very expensive. So I'm like, well, that's not really the answer we're looking for yet. So the bottom line is more discussion needs to be had. We need to take a look. I've looked at the budgets. Um, we may end up having to ask for additional funding, but the bottom line is um, we hear you. And at this point, it's going to be how do we get there? So uh, several of you, uh, from I've spoken at Fairway Village a couple times, but I just want to let you know, we've kind of let Vicki, rather than all three of us handling the issue, it's, it's better off just for staff time and for DOT time, to be quite frank, to let someone, and I appreciate the work that Vicki's done on this, I'm in complete agreement. Um, if, if we need a joint letter from all of us, we can, but we, will, we are all in agreement on, on the barriers and, and what we need to do. So I, I, you've been heard and we will continue to work on that issue. Yes, ma'am. Emma, I, I really appreciate your question. I truly do. And um, this issue is probably one of the most important and um, high impact, I, I don't know what else to call it really, um, uh, issues of our time. I honestly believe that. And so I really appreciate Emma, you bringing up this question. Um, I signed on the bill, and I'm gonna tell you the primary reason I did, because let's just face it, kind of back to what I said earlier, right? Um, we're in a, an extreme minority, and really, quite frankly, I don't even think all, I, I know all of my caucus, you know, House Republicans, wouldn't sign on to this bill. So you might ask, why on earth would you do that, knowing this bill is not going to move anywhere, the session? And it was dropped late in the session, uh, you know, really. So arguably, it's not even going to move uh, this session. Because I believe it's important to have the dialogue. And you know, um, Emma, my heart goes out to you. I've not been in your shoes. I don't, I don't personally know anybody who's had to endure that. I do know a lot of women have, and I think that's a bigger cultural issue we need to address. Uh, treating others like you would want to be treated, right? So um, sorry you've had to endure that. I come at it from a different perspective uh, as one who's adopted. And I don't know, are any others in the room adopted, or have you adopted kids by chance? Not many. Um, Adoption is a massive gift. It is a very, very big gift. Um, my natural mother, uh, who I still haven't met today, but I have talked on the phone, um, 
she chose, right back to your point of choice, she chose to give me life. If she had made the other choice to abort me, I would not be sitting in front of you today. There, and let me just say, for I want to recognize those of you in the room who are very strong about the right to choose, right? I, I, I'm a woman, right? So I, I, I want to be respectful of that. The thing I will say is I think one of the very important pieces we have to look at in this conversation is the power of your choice. The power of your choice. We all start as you know, a result of a sperm and an egg coming together, right? We all know that, most of us, uh, you know, that are above the age of whatever. Um, so we all started in the same way. And the opportunity to just have time to grow and, you know, be born, that's the only thing that separates us from somebody who doesn't have that, that option. That's okay. It's a life. It's it's a life. It's a life. And you know, I recognize that. And I also just want to say, you know what, I will tell you, now this bill was very, uh, I'll call it comprehensive, right, to your point, felony, et cetera. Um, the, the thing that I would look at uh, if you know any legislation really does move at some point with this, is the right for a mother. If a mother's life is in danger, that husband and wife, or you know that they have to decide what's best for them. And I, I would choose life, um, and and go through that. Um, but I don't think even when evil is done, right? Let's just call that. And I'm so sorry, but really, when that evil is done toward a person. Should we then turn around and take a harmful action toward another life, which is that mother's child, even if they didn't want that child, even if they're angry, upset, I, you know, it, it difficult situation, but in the end, you can give that child up for adoption. So, yeah, and you're not anybody want to child address this or are we done? No. Okay, I think we're, yeah. I, I was going to say, yeah, and I just want to recognize this, yeah. You know, I recognize this is a very, um, it's just, it's a, I'll call it a heated issue. It's a real debate, uh, certainly in our community, society, nation. So I want to recognize that, and I want to recognize the importance of that. I, I, because I signed on to that bill, I'm going to take that question unless either of my colleagues really, really wants to jump in on this, but they have not, you know, uh, they haven't signed on to that bill. Um, with that, uh, I, I'd say if we want to have one other question or com you know question on this, I, you know, we'll take it. But I'm going to ask that again. We have so many issues that happen this session. I would ask that we continue the conversation, maybe on a different issue. But does anybody else want to say something on this? Uh, maybe from a which the in the purple yeah. in the purple. The okay, the we're gonna we're gonna come and, and we will be around if you want to talk further with us uh, for a little bit. Um, the lady in the purple. This is the follow up. <laughs> You said that if you are you are concerned with the power of the choice that a person makes, mm -hmm. is that correct? Correct. So your solution would be to take the power of choice away. To it seems to me that this whole would you rather preserve life? Okay. Just a moment. Let's this question is for me to answer, but thank you. Uh, go ahead. So it seems to me that taking away of power of women over our own bodies and I don't understand why that is so unequal. We do not legislate men's bodies. <laughs> that actually might be a good idea to solve some of this problem. Anyway, um, uh, no, on a serious note, I recognize the power of the choice, and here's the thing, that baby in the womb has no choice. 
So with that, with that, we've asked a couple questions. No, it's a baby. We all start as an embryo. Okay, I appreciate, you know what, we could all probably debate this for a long time. Um, I want to be, thank you for the respectfulness of this, of, of all of you. We know these are some difficult issues. I knew when I signed on that bill, I would probably hear from a few of you. So thank you for the comments, uh, and more importantly, the questions. And uh, happy to continue discussion later, but let's move to another issue. Do you want to? Well, to answer your, the beginning of your question, I can tell you what uh, administrative salaries, if, if you believe all the numbers, if you look at the numbers and try to de decipher, it's between 5 and 7%, depending on the district, goes towards administration salaries. 5 to 7%. Well, I understand that the local school here have to pay for the school building are not teachers. Uh, I, I, I don't know that that's accurate, but I, I, you, the first part of your question was you were wondering what administrators, what, what percent of the salary. I need to dig into the numbers to more and make sure that those are actually accurate, but if you look at the figures today, it's between 5 and 7 percent is going to administration. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes, I, I, we could. I believe, I cannot remember the reason why we are not allowed to do that in Washington State. There's, I forget, I, that was several years ago when I learned about that. But um, yeah, I think um, on top of that, uh, I, I just heard that there's new charter schools opening up. And one of the first charter schools that opened up when they were allowed, because we allowed 40 of them here in the state of Washington, um, that 100% of the children that graduated are going to go to college out of that first class. So that was good news, I think, that um, it, it, and that was a big win for everyone there with the charter schools. So, um, but always we'd like to have options, and I think vouchers would be a good option. I don't know that that's going to go anywhere, but we'd be agreeable. <laughs> go ahead, sure, right there, green shirt. I don't know your name. Yeah, you. Right. We said no to tax, uh, to capital tax. Are you saying you're saying carbon tax? Yes. Okay, right, right, and you and you're right. The, the public has voted that down um, the last few times that it's been given to the people, and and generously so. I mean, it was a a, a large number that voted it down. Um, they we did have the bill this year that it want, it's uh, you have, we have to be carbon free by the year 2045, and um, what. The thing is about these bills is that it doesn't do anything to cap carbon, right? It's, it's basically increases in taxes. And it'll increase our energy, attack, um, the cost of our energy, and then everything else because it, you use energy for producing um, you know, vehicles and, and whatever it is, it's going to increase because that's the way all these bills happen. Um, we actually had um, locally, so in that bill, they want to remove the ability to use natural gas. Well, I don't know about you, but um, there's a lot of people in Clark County that use natural gas, right? So they want to phase that out because that's not re renewable or right, clean. It's not clean energy. So they want to. So you know, our Clark County PUD, they were actually up there and lobbying against the bill because they do have that um, the river, road, the river natural gas plant. right the plant right and correct and so um, with that plant they know in order for them to switch over from gas to other um, c clean energies it's going to skyrocket our prices down here so um, we're with you on that I right we said right you know and there were several things there's several things up there that I believe we should have given to the voter to vote on this year, and that didn't happen. Um, but that's what happens when you have, um, you know, a large minority or majority. And um, quite frankly, we weren't included in a lot of discussions this year in, in uh, budgets and a lot of the bills. Um, amendments weren't taken on good bills. Um, so, you know, our, our voice, we're, we're, we're clawing back, but... Um, 
our voices are minimized right now. That's what elections have consequences, and that's exactly where we're at. So a couple of years ago, we passed a bill to replace the bridge. And right, it was basically to start the process toward replacing the I-5 bridge. It is 101 years old in the first span, and it is 61 years old in the second span. Well, the second span was built the year I was born. Um, so it's old. <laughs> uh, but we do know that there's issues with the bridge, because uh, safety-wise, because it, it isn't um, seismically sound. Um, and we also know that in order to uh, create or make it seismically sound, it would cost us um, up to a billion dollars in and time to close the bridge down in order to do it. And then even then, it wouldn't be as safe as a new bridge. So we passed the bill to have the discussion. We actually have met with Portland or Oregon um, to begin the talks because we know that nothing will happen until we talk to Oregon. And Oregon is on board with us. Um, and then along with that bill, we understand we have to uh, replace that bridge, but we also know we're going to, we need another bridge. And so that is built into that bill so that we have those discussions. Um, our governor is basically uh, hindering us a bit. He, he, he's li liking the idea of the bridge. And of course the governor in Oregon is she said back when she was running for office that she wanted us to get serious about it. Well, we've been meeting for three years on this, and we're all, I mean, our delegation is basically all on board with, um, you know, looking at what we need to do to replace the bridge and, and furthermore down the line with our second, our third and fourth bridges that we know we need. Uh, but he stuck on um, light rail being on that bridge, and that's not where basically any of us are anymore. It's, it's, um, we're looking at maybe bus rapid transit. And even Governor Brown has said that she is open to that and not insisting on light rail anymore because that's going to be a sticking point. I know when we wrote the bill, that was not discussed. We came up with eight points that we agreed on as Democrats and Republicans in, the, in this delegation in Southwest Washington. And we, um, we agreed upon those. And so that's what we're working toward. We know that it has to happen. Um, it's, but it's, it's really taking the time to, or getting Oregon to sit down and, we, you know, like I said, we met with them once. Uh, they're still in session, are just about ready to get out of session, and so we understood that we're going to have more conversations now that they're out of session. So it's on the table, and we, you know, we know the importance of it. So um, I don't know if that. I think we need to recognize the bad blood that has to be resolved between us and Oregon because of what happened before. I mean, and, and they're understanding that, and, and it's like, okay, well. Right, but that we're done with that now, and we're moving forward, and we are on board. You can't so, blame for not exactly well, there was issues. The well, sure. Well, there there is, but I'm not I'm not so sure that there. Right, but we've got to get past that if we if we're going to be doing that, and, and they they pummeled us in the beginning in that meeting that we had, and then we moved on. And so I do believe that we are moving forward, and we've recognized that in moving forward. Now, we, we know we had issues with that previous bridge, and there's reasons why it happened the way it did. But, um, but yes, we are moving forward. I'm going to say really quick. Um, I, I, I just wanted to, one, on that point that was just made, uh, give big kudos to my colleagues. Um, I did not actually sign on to that I five replacement bridge, bridge bill. Um, I am a proponent of a third bridge first to reduce uh, congestion in the I-5 corridor. Um, and then look at replacing the bridge. Um, so I've been working to get um, steps toward that pass. They haven't passed yet. But going back to this, uh, this point, the one thing that I really appreciate in particular about the legislation that um, my colleagues worked to pass and their efforts since then is to meet and re-engage Oregon. Um, I had done a couple reaches out to individual legislators, right, recognizing there was some, uh, you know, mending to be done. Um, but for legislation to have passed that then 
you know, sets up really a more formal mechanism to re-engage. That is really, that is, for me, that was the key piece out of that legislation. So even though we, you know, differ on kind of what's next step, um, that piece we all agree is very critical. So we formed a bridge commission, a bi-state uh, bridge commission that was uh, recognized by the state of Oregon. It was passed by the state of Washington. We put in $17 million uh, this year to, to set up an office now to start that discussion. Uh, we're waiting for Oregon to do the same thing. Uh, Oregon's budget, to be quite frank, isn't as good as ours. They haven't done as well in this economy as we have. They have a huge PERS problem that, that we don't have. Um, uh, there is some bad blood there, but I've got to be honest with you, the, the, the business climate in Oregon is not near what ours has been. And we have a lot more money than the state of Oregon and a lot more reserves than they have, uh, a much better functioning government as far as money than they do. Um, and it's easier for us to come to the table now um, because they don't have a lot of money, to be quite frank. And so it'll be interesting to see. They have participated. They have uh, said they are very interested. Uh, they are putting money into the Rose Quarter as we speak. Uh, they're having some issues with that, but they are doing that. So I, I believe the climate's right, and I believe it will happen. Yeah. Who wants to jump in on well, I, so we did try to run bills to uh, actually amend a bill to ha to require him to pay back the state for his campaigning with use the, the use of fund of our funding, but um, that didn't go anywhere. Um, so. You know, I know that by law, it's okay he can do that. Um, there's other states, though, that have same same type of law, but they've actually paid back. Um, the, the, the candidate has actually paid back the state because that's personally the right thing to do. But, um, uh, and this, the, you're, you're speaking of the sanctuary state. The governor signed the bill. The bill went through the legislature. Um, that's how that happened. So, um, no, we don't get to vote on that, right? But the, like I said, there's a lot of things that this year that we should have. Yeah, well, I voted no. So, uh, yeah, right. So. We have five, okay. five minutes. Left. Okay, we have five minutes. So um, I'm going to go back to Alan in the back there. Okay. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna if I could, Alan, because we're running short on time. So if an illegal alien doesn't have a job, they don't get freebies. Right. Yeah. I think, okay, so we get the gist of the question, and I appreciate that, Alan, and, and Alan is very, um, he's good on statistics, so I appreciate that. Um, as far as E-Verify, the question was, um, why doesn't the state pass uh, a law to implement E-Verify everywhere with then consequences if a business owner doesn't follow that? Um, in short, uh, I'll go back to my earlier uh, how I started. The makeup of the legislature right now, it would be very unlikely that E-Verify would pass. Um, so that's that. There are some, um, there are, you know, some um, industries, I'll say, within agriculture in particular, right, that um, have some desire for workers that um, they can, you know, that are more amenable to doing that type of work, et cetera. Um, I will tell you, I actually dug into with HHS uh, about a year and a half ago what the cost for the state was, like what, what amount of monies were we paying out for um, you know, people who are non-citizens here in Washington, and it's pretty astounding. Um, the bottom line is, you know, my, so when you mentioned Romania, my, my good friend is here from Romania. <laughs> she's, she's, you know, legal citizen, and if it weren't for her, I wouldn't be married. So um, <laughs> she played Cupid. But the bottom line is, you know, there's a process, and, you know, we welcome anybody to come and go through the process, and I'll just tell you quickly, my niece, who is like 25 roughly, 
she's a U.S. citizen, went over to uh, Ireland, uh, met and married an Irish lad here about three years ago, was there two years, tried to come back, bring her husband, right, legally. She had to get in line and wait for 18 months before, you know, after going through all the paperwork, talking to her congressional um, office, trying to help, et cetera. She had to wait in line as a U.S. citizen to refugees and others that were coming in. So that to me is a bit of a problem. I think our U.S. citizens who are citizens should, you know, we need to take care of our own first, but absolutely those who want to come legally, happy to, to do that. Um, right, the last question I think is going to be more for Paul. So you mentioned in the beginning, important to you, um, the bills that you focus so as I vote for you, I think I'm thinking that you're going to represent constituents, including myself. So to me, it I was a little stumbled on that. Um, so when you also said your first step in community, can you tell me more? What's your next step? Next step? Are you trying to get rid of the religious exemptions or further to all vaccines? Tell me a little bit more about your. Well, I find it. I, I find I, I thought your question is interesting. So I think the vast majority of the community is vaccinated. In fact, well over 75%. Well over 75%. So uh, is, your, is your question, what am I going to do on vaccines next? I plan on doing nothing on vaccines next. This bill was just imposed. Um, I thought it was interesting, too, the way you said that I took away someone's right. It's interesting because the other individual that still can't go to school, they think you took away their right to go to school. So be very careful. Be very careful on how you, how you say that because it depends on who the child is and whose, whose freedom is being impelled upon. So you look at it one way. The vast majority, to be quite frank, I think look at it the other way. In fact, I, well, they say they don't, they don't agree with me. That's okay. Once again, 75% are getting vaccinated. But I still have a student. I still have a student today that can't. And we underdefine and define power of choice differently because we just, I didn't say you specifically. Oh, well, I guess it would depend whose choice it is. You're right. If, 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 you, had, if you had a compromised immune system choice, and, and, I, and I heard from those people, and I still, I'm still hearing from them, actually. I just heard from one last Saturday, actually, that was, um, anyway. So I don't plan on doing anything more with vaccines. First off, I think it would be wrong to do something more because the bill's just being enacted. We got to see, I'm, I'm of the opinion, you wait and see what happens. You got to wait and see what happens with vaccine rates. Um, 6,000 kids got vaccinated in four weeks because of an outbreak. The worst time to get vaccinated, and typically people, it, it is, it's the worst time to get vaccinated because that's when you could have someone who's maybe came across the disease and gets vaccinated and then has a bad reaction, they would go to the VARs and report that as maybe as a bad vaccine when actually they came in contact with the disease and that was the reason. The time to get vaccinated, of course, is now. Um, and it's not when there's a breakout. Um, and so I don't, I don't plan on doing anything more in vaccines, to be quite frank. Uh, I wouldn't do anything more in tobacco. Uh, I think you got to wait and see how these bills, what, what happens in society and what happens, what takes place. And that would be, I think, what, what common sense would do. And, you know, um, but this isn't a common sense bill. This has been, this has been the most fascinating bill to be quite frank, I never dreamed of when I went into session of doing a vaccine bill. Wasn't even on my radar. Um, I felt my community had 74 cases. Um, I was approached to do it. Um, it's not my, I don't have a bent on vaccines, which is interesting. I did have death threats from this bill though. So I just find it odd. Of all, of all bills, I'm sitting on the House floor and I get a text from the State Patrol that, and I just think it's odd. I mean, th we are in odd times. We really are. That, that where we disagree on, a, on an issue and, you know, it, it just shouldn't be that way. So I don't have any, I'm not going to take, a, I have no intentions of doing anything more with vaccines. At least certainly not next session. I, we got to wait and see what happens. Probably several years, actually, and see what happens. It will, it'll take a while, but that's mine. That's me. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So with that, we want to say thank you to everybody who came. If if you wanted to ask a question, didn't get to. I know we'll be here for a little bit. Uh, 
um, for you know at least a few minutes. But thank you to all of you for taking the time and the questions and the discussion. Thank you.